This episode of the HVAC School Podcast is made possible by our happy, fantastic, incredible sponsors. Carrier, Mitsubishi Electric Cooling and Heating, the UEI Hub Smart Kit, both their air probes, temperature and humidity, and their pressure and line temperature probes. You can find out more about this kit by going to ueitest.com. Refrigeration Technologies at refrigetech.com, makers of wet rag, Viper products, Nylog, and the new pan and drain spray, which Bert was just telling me about. Mm-hmm. You care to comment on that? Yeah, I've uh, really liked it so far. It smells fantastic. I like it because I can spray it exactly where I want it from like two feet away. <laughs> do, do no, you, you would be surprised how helpful that do is. You try to stand like really far back and hit a spot. Well, you get all sorts of opportunities when you're doing AC work to do that. I wouldn't know anything about that, would to I? To sharpen your aim. Yeah. Yeah. And then also Aeroasis, the bipolar and nano whole home purification products, which Bird also has in his house. Care to comment about that? They're fantastic. You're saying fantastic too much. Oh. That's my word. Oh. I've been very happy. Noticed the immediate difference in the way my house smelled. Originally, we had a pretty bad, after we moved in, mold outbreak in our house behind our sink. We had a leak, so we had to have that taken care of. And at the time, our uh, twins just came home from the hospital, they're brand new babies, and they got exposed to some stuff and allergies from it, things like that. And so, anyways, Long story short, still dealing with some of the overlap from that. And the kids were pretty much every night, right about midnight, waking up, coughing. And my son Isaiah always having respiratory issues. So we went ahead and put those in our home to help clean up our air and see how that would work. And less than a week, they stopped coughing in the night. They haven't woke up coughing since. Well, it sounds like you're making a false claim here, Bert. It does. I'm going to call the FCC on you. You can call whoever you like. Okay. And maybe they were false just having a wake up in the middle of the night cough thing for three months in a row, and it's gone now. That's fine. But the reality is I've noticed a difference, and I feel like it's made a difference for them. So I'm happy about that. We did the Petri test before and after, about 70% improvement. A lot of people have seen that test out there. Some pretty ugly pictures from the original results when we did the test in my house. I'm definitely happy about that. I'm glad it's working out for you. Yeah. Now I have a story to tell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It just needs to get shorter. Yes, absolutely. All right. You can find out more about all of the Air Oasis products by going to airoasis.com. Also want to thank RetroTech. RetroTech makers of uh, really good quality precision manometer. We use it. It's called the DM32. We actually have two of them. They can then be used with a blower door or with a duct leakage tester or if you're doing zonal pressure testing. Any really advanced pressure testing in a space where you're measuring down into the Pascal range. We highly recommend the RetroTech products and specifically the DM32. And finally, want to mention WriteSoft. WriteSoft and WriteSoft.com, really good software for doing manual J and manual D. I was at the Humid Climate Conference the other day in Austin, and Corbett Lunsford cornered me, as he often does, and asked me what product we use for loads and for duct design, and I recommended WriteSoft. Uh, he went home, got right soft, and he just texted me yesterday and said he's really been enjoying it, and he wonders why he hadn't done it sooner. So you can find out more about Right Soft by going to rightsoft.com. That's W-R-I-G-H-T soft.com. And now, the man who stays humble because he has two teenage sons who always let him know how much smarter they are than him, Brian Orr. First of all, you know, what is this podcast for? Do you know? I don't. You don't? No. Not this episode, but the podcast, oh, the podcast in, general. Yeah, in general. It's the podcast that, do you know the line? Teaches you some things you might not have already known. <laughs> Reminds <laughs> no. you some no. things. It's for techs, by techs, uh-huh. and... It broadens um, your knowledge in the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning field. Okay. I don't know the line. The line is, oh, the actual line it helps you right. remember some things you might have forgotten about the HVAC trade, as well as helps you remember some things you might have forgotten to know in the first place. Ah, uh, uh, I remember that now. Different versions of it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I basically said the same thing. Yeah. I'm trying to be cute, basically, oh, is what it comes right. down to. I mean, that's it's kind of a cutesy thing. Anyway, I'm Brian, and with us today we have uh, Bert. 
What's up? Yeah, Bert. Some of you know Bert. Bert's a little bit of a cult figure. Yeah. And the HVAC school group, especially. That's why I have two names online. What are those? I don't know. Whenever I'm on Facebook, uh-huh. my name is Jesse. Oh, so, the like, name is Jesse, isn't it? It is. Yeah. <laughs> and so people are probably like, who is this guy? Right. And then we have Kieran with us. Good morning. You'll notice that Kieran sounds a little different. It's because he's from Montana. Montana. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to notice that strong Montana accent. Yeah. Yeah. He says some weird words. Like when we were working together, I noticed he said. Is that a lie? Britches. <laughs> Did he? Trousers. Trousers. I yeah, was probably like. Trousers, yeah. And I was like, you should keep going. <laughs> Pants. Nailed it. So we're working on that. Yeah. He also said rubbish. <laughs> he was picking up stuff in the bottom of my van and said, better grab all this rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, trash, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, so Kieran is not from Montana. As they say in the Andy Griffith show, he's from the old country. From Great Britain. <laughs> from Great Britain. Oh, we just call it Britain because we <laughs> aren't sure how great it is. Yeah. But uh, anyway. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about the basic refrigerant circuit, and we did an episode about the basic refrigerant circuit at the beginning of HVAC school, and Bert told me the other day, he said, we need to get back to the basics again. And then I said, well, I could republish it, and you're like, no, you need to re-record it, Yeah, because it was kind of jacked up, I guess was your feeling about it. That was my feeling about it, only I never told you that. Right. So I'm not sure who you were talking to. Okay. So Bert and Kieran's role here are to heckle me, mostly. That's the primary job. So Bert's job is head heckler. Uh-huh. Kieran's role is head question asker. Okay. Okay. So you have to ask questions, All right. even if they're completely irrelevant, just random questions. All right. <laughs> About the basic refrigeration cycle. Or you could ask me questions like, do I think that the movie Watership Down is inappropriate for children, for example? And the answer is no. It has lots of rabbit violence, but it's very important for children to see that. <laughs> <laughs> This is going to be a terrible podcast. Okay. This is great. Basic refrigerant circuit. So the four basic components. So let's go through the components and lines because that is the first thing that my instructor made me do when I went into AC school. In Winter Garden, Florida, Ron Carey was his name, made me stand at the whiteboard and write over and over the four basic components and the four basic lines. And there's one controversial one out of this eight. And so let's see if you can pick up which it is. Is it the metering device? Metering device is not controversial. No, no. The metering device stays away from conversations about politics and religion at <laughs> Thanksgiving. <laughs> right. It's very uncontroversial. The no. receiver? No, the receiver is not one of the four. It's not the compressor. It's not the evaporator. It's not the condenser. No, but again, there's four components and there's four lines. Okay. okay. So compressor, condenser, metering device, evaporator. Those are the four components. All right. And then the four lines are... Can Discharge. You, okay. Head. No, we're supposed to have controversy there. No, no, there's no head because discharge line, when we say head pressure. Oh, sorry. I mean, discharge, suction, run. Is it run? Do we call it run for something? I saw something in a book the other day. I think this is the Great British coming in and interfering. Liquid uh-huh. line. Yeah, okay. So we got and three. Two phase line, I guess. Okay, we'll see. That. This is the controversial one. All right. So we've got, well, let's do them in order. Between the compressor and the condenser is the what line? Bird. Discharge. Discharge line. Between the condenser and the metering device is the liquid line. Is the liquid line. He said you knew that one. Between the metering device and the evaporator. Two phase. Okay, so he calls it the two phase line. Some people call it sometimes there is no line, right? In fact, in a lot of most cases in residential, there's no line at all. We don't see a line. I call it the expansion line. Some people will call it the flash gas line. There's another name that people call it. I call it capillary tubes. <laughs> No, that's the metering device. No, well, that's not a capillary tube. Okay, quickly. There's this a is, lot of controversy on this, and I'm just going to make my own stand here. <laughs> no, quickly. A capillary tube is a type of metering device that is just mm. a small tube. And the amount of restriction, the conductance rate through that capillary tube is based on the diameter, the internal diameter of the capillary tube, and what other factor? The pressure of the refrigerant. Well, Speed of the flow. No, that affects it. But as far as how much that capillary tube restricts is based on the internal diameter plus what? How many Times tubes? what? No, because a true capillary tube is only one tube. Okay. It's the length of the, the length capillary of the tube. tube. Yeah. The length of the tube. Oh, yeah. So the longer the length, the more it restricts and the diameter. And so you'll see cap tubes primarily in small refrigeration. I mean, that's old refrigerators, that sort of thing. That's where you're going to, and even a lot of modern refrigerators are going to have cap tubes in them. A capillary tube is not the same as a distributor tube. 
and this is something that technicians get confused, they'll call it a capillary tube. And basically in the field, they say that to mean any small tube. Right. Like, oh, that's a capillary tube. Well, mm-hmm. no, a capillary tube is a specific type of metering device, okay. you know, like technically speaking. Mm-hmm. Anyway, all right, so you have the compressor condenser metering device evaporator, the line between the metering device and the evaporator, I call the expansion line, but it really doesn't matter what you call it so long as you know what it is. Where is a case in the type of work we do where you will actually see an expansion line? I see it on mini splits. Mm. Mini splits, yes, also known as ductless. Yes. All right, so as you know, I've worked with True Tech Tools, T-R-U, techtools.com, since the very beginning. Bill Spohn is one of the first people who I talked to after I started the HVAC School podcast about sponsoring and turning this into something that was a little bigger. And we never ended up doing a true sponsorship, but what we found is is that Bill and I just help each other. We work together. No money changes hands, but we just find ways to help one another as we both serve the industry. Bill does a lot of really great things for the industry. A lot of you may not know this, but Jim Bergman who is one of the common guests who come on. He's the founder of MeasureQuick, the MeasureQuick app, as well as the owner and, I guess, chief development officer or whatever, product development for Redfish Instruments. Super smart guy. And uh, he actually founded, was one of the founders of True Tech Tools as well. So when you see sort of the excellence that goes into True Tech Tools technically, that has a lot to do with both Bill Spohn, the current president, and Jim Bergman, who later on left True Tech Tools to start some other adventures. But it's a really good company. And one thing you may not know is that you can get a lot of the products that I talk about here on the podcast, the Testo products. I've talked a lot about Testos, the Testo 605Is. You can get the UEI Hub Smart Kits, the hygrometers, the Hub 2 and the Hub 4. The Hub 2 is the thermal hygrometers, the induct humidity and temperature sensors that I like so much with the really thin probes. You can also get their pressure and temperature probes by going to truetechtools.com and use the offer code GETSCHOOLED. You get a great discount. Another product that you may not know that you can get from True Tech Tools is the Refrigeration Technologies products. So they're Viper Cleaners, Nylog, most of the products from Refrigeration Technologies you can get at True Tech Tools if your local provider doesn't happen to have it. And then also you can get the RetroTech blower doors and duct leakage testers that I talk about quite often from True Tech Tools as well. So a lot of different products. I would suggest that you take a look at True Tech Tools if you haven't been there recently and see the great discounts you can get by using our offer code get schooled. All right, here we go. Back to the basic refrigerant circuit. All right, so you have the compressor condenser metering device evaporator. We're between the metering device and the evaporator now. And then between the evaporator and the compressor, what is that line called? Suction. That's called the suction line, right? So these are all fairly obvious names. So let's go through why they're obvious names. All right, suction line. Why do we call it the suction line? Because the compressor sucks the refrigerant. (laughs) Because the compressor is drawing the refrigerant back on the low pressure side. The discharge line, why do we call it the discharge line? Because the compressor discharges to the condenser. The liquid line, why do we call it the liquid line? Because the condenser condenses the vapor refrigerant into a high pressure liquid. Correct. And why do we call it the expansion line? Because the metering device usually sort of spits it out as a two-phase mix of liquid and vapor to the evaporator. Right, because it has a pressure drop. When you give it that pressure drop, which is the job of the metering device, then it expands on the other side and it begins to expand into a vapor. So it starts to make that change. And in fact, what it's doing is boiling. All right. So now let's go through and talk about each component and what each component actually does. Okay. What the job of each component is. Bert, I feel like I'm losing you, buddy. No, it's okay. I'm here. All right. Okay. I'm still here. That's good. So you have the compressor. Why is it a compressor and not a pump? Because it compresses the refrigerant because it makes a higher pressure. Yeah. I mean, it takes in the low pressure vapor refrigerant from the evaporator and discharges it as a high pressure vapor refrigerant to the condenser. So a pump could move liquid, but a compressor is not going to move liquid. Why not? Because it actually is literally compressing the refrigerant and a liquid does not compress. So a lot of people will say a liquid is non-compressible, and which is not true. Everything is compressible, okay. um, but it requires so much force right. to compress a liquid. I mean, if you see hydraulics in a bulldozer, for example, you're using a compressed liquid to drive these crazy, crazy amounts of force, and you're using it because a liquid doesn't compress, at least not in any significant way. Yeah. So we can't run liquid through a compressor. That's one of the absolute rules of a compressor. You don't run liquid through it. But the reason it's a compressor, the reason why it compresses is because it's taking a vapor and it's taking it from a larger volume and it's forcing it into a smaller volume. 
That's what you're doing. A pump can't do that with a liquid. So if you have a water pump, for example, and you look at how a water pump is designed, like a little circulating pump, little taco pump or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's taco or taco, whatever. I know a lot of my hydronic <laughs> guys are like, well, this guy's a friggin' idiot. He doesn't even know what I'm saying. <laughs> well, let's go to Grundfos, a Grundfos pump. You open it up and there's this little impeller. I mean, it's like a little fan and it just spins and moves the water along. It's not compressing the water. Right. So it's a different design. There is a difference between a compressor and a pump. And a lot of the metaphors we use when we talk about the refrigerant circuit or even when we talk about electrical theory, in a lot of cases, we pretend like it is a pump. We use a lot of analogies with water, but of course, water and it's where we normally interact with it is a liquid, and so it's not the same. You take this low temperature, low pressure vapor, right? You run it into the compressor, and what does it do once it gets inside that compressor? Bert, I'll let you take this one. What happens to it? gets compressed by the compressor. What does it do first before it gets compressed by the compressor? It cools the compressor as it passes through. That's important for the compressor. Before getting compressed. If you imagine, so imagine a residential light commercial system. Yeah. Like typical systems that you work on. Okay. Every day. Yeah. Right? Every day. Yeah. Because every day you're hustling, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's true about you especially. So you work on these compressors and you imagine that refrigerant going into that suction line of that compressor. Think of a scroll compressor, okay? You see, it dumps down into that suction line and dumps down in. What is it doing? It's definitely moving and possibly picking up some oil if it's going through an accumulator, but also picking up some heat from the compressor. What does the accumulator have to do with it? Why'd you bring that up? I'm just trying to figure out what you're aiming at. I'm just saying that, like, if you imagine this, because here's how I used I'm to I'm imagining it. it, but I don't see a lot happening before it gets compressed. Okay. All right. That's good. It's good that that's how you feel about it. Right. So I used to imagine that the refrigerant went into that compressor, like that little pipe there, right? Mm -hmm. It went into the compressor and that pipe then fed right into the head of that compressor and it just pumped it right out. Yeah. yeah. But that's not what happens, Probably is Probably what, that is what I picture in my head, but right. you're right, that's not what happens. No, what happens? You just pretty much fill the inside of that compressor with vapor. Right. Oof, it's just loaded, that whole chamber. Right. That whole inside shell mm -hmm. is like a big refrigerant container. That's pretty cool. Okay, and packed inside that refrigerant container is what? Two things, primarily. Oil. Well, okay. <laughs> Mm. Oil, I keep going back to the there. oil. Yeah, you really want to I can't let go right of now. that. I know. Okay. What is in there? Oil. Okay. What else? Vapor refrigerant. Right. What else? Oil. <laughs> if you say oil again, I'm going <laughs> to kick you on the knees. Inside that compressor? Right. Well, there's some windings right. and so, some uh, mechanics. So what do you call the windings? What is that called? Winding. What is it called? Copper. What is it called? A thing that has windings in it that make things go spinny. What's that called? A motor? A motor. I used to call it an engine. <laughs> it's not. I literally called it an engine for like it's my first not, two months. No, don't do that. So it's a motor, right? Yeah. And then what else is in there? Gasoline. <laughs> no. Okay. No, there's Away no, from the there's engine. no gasoline. Stay, get on to get focus here. Pistons. Yeah, so you have, well, in a scroll compressor, you don't have the oh, no, pistons. No, scroll. But you would just call it the actual compressor portion, the head of the compressor, the part that actually does the compressing, right? Yeah. Okay. Makes sense? You yep. with me? Follow me? Okay. Absolutely. All right. Good. Do you have oil? You have vapor. You have the motor that drives. Again, I keep wanting to say pump. I mean, that's naturally how we want to think about mm -hmm. it, but it's not actually pump. It's actually the compressor portion, the mechanical portion that compresses the refrigerant. All right. So your refrigerant goes down that section line, dumps down inside that compressor. And inside that compressor, there is oil. And there is also this hot motor. A motor produces heat. It's sealed in there. So that refrigerant is going to pick up a lot of that heat from that motor. So it's going to cool the motor. It's also going to cool the internal components of the compressor itself because you have friction. You know, that thing's spinning around in there and you got to get all that heat out of there, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one of the jobs of the refrigerant is the refrigerant has to be low enough temperature. It has to have enough refrigerant density that it can cool that compressor. Right? Hopefully below 61 degrees. <laughs> no. Not below 61 degrees. No. Hopefully below 61 degrees. Oh, the refrigerant being yeah. below 61 degrees. That's entering that compressor. Okay. Or Copeland will find you. I think it's 65. I respect that. Okay. I respect that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, Copeland recommends, and I correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe it's 65 degrees. They want the refrigerant to be less than that on a typical high temp air conditioning application in order to properly cool that refrigerant. But it also, even more importantly than the temperature of the refrigerant, is the density of the refrigerant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how can you tell the density of the refrigerant coming into the compressor. The PSI? The PSI, also known as the pressure. Uh, Square inch. Pounds per 
square inch. Pounds per square inch. Yes, coming in. So the higher the pressure, the more the refrigerant density. It's kind of cool how that works. Yeah, it's it is. pretty simple. So the temperature of it and the density of it dictate how well it's going to cool that compressor. That's it. Pretty simple. Mm-hmm. We also have to care about the oil. And so if we bring liquid into that compressor, it goes down that suction line, dumps down in there, mixes with that oil, and there's liquid in it. What's going to happen to that oil? Well, that oil is going to tend to start to foam. You're going to dilute that oil with liquid refrigerant, and that's going to create lubrication problems. Oil is not going to do what it's supposed to do if you bring liquid refrigerant into that compressor, right? Yeah. Wow. So it's not good. So in my head, I always pictured, like you said, that tube feeding straight into that compression. And when there was liquid in it, it was just being smashed straight into the compression. <laughs> right into that, right. But there is a chance for it to boil off there. It's a extremely likely chance. Like yeah. <laughs> the odds that you're going Actually to fill. slug a compressor with it running right. are super slim, super slim. When we talk about slugging a compressor, that's more for air-cooled compressors mm. when you're running the equipment. It can happen. So I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's very unlikely that you're going to slug a compressor. Right. All right. What we do when we bring liquid into a compressor, into the crankcase itself, we flood the compressor. Yeah. Flooding the compressor means that you're just bringing liquid into the crankcase. Yeah. And it's mixing with that oil and it's foaming and it's you end up losing the oil and the compressor doesn't get, it washes out the bearing surfaces, washes the oil off because it's a solvent. So when you have that boiling refrigerant, imagine it, it's like taking one of those electronics cleaners and spraying it on something because it actually boils off and it removes the oil off of whatever you're cleaning or whatever. It's exactly the same thing that's happening when you're bringing that in. Because you don't just have the compression chamber you have all the bearings and everything that's leading up to it. Because you imagine you have this motor, and then you have it attached to the compression chamber with a shaft, and all those bearings have to be properly lubricated. So bringing liquid into the compressor while it's running is bad, but that's not slugging on most of the refrigerant-cooled compressors that we work on. Most of the compressors we work on are refrigerant-cooled compressors. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, there is such a thing as an air-cooled compressor, and you'll see this in refrigeration in some cases. And in an air-cooled compressor, you have a motor that's completely separate. Like, it doesn't do what we've been talking about here, where the refrigerant dumps into the crankcase. So it's got this separate thing. In that case, it's exactly how you imagined it initially. It goes down that suction line, hits that head, gets pumped out. Well, if you have any liquid in that sucker, it's going to blow that head to high heaven. And I've kind of wondered that before. Like, you show up, and you got zero subcool or superheat and a frozen evap, and it's running, and I'm like... How is this compressor even? How is it surviving? Yeah. Real quick, this won't take very long. I want to mention to you about AMRAD, American Radionics. They're a company that makes capacitors here in the U.S. And when I heard that they manufacture capacitors in the U.S., I thought, well, maybe they assemble them. I wasn't sure. But I went up to their factory, and it is a legitimate factory. I mean, they make these things from scratch. They actually wind up the capacitors. And he showed me all the different ways that they can make multiple capacitors from a single winding in the capacitor from a single plate that's wound up. He showed how they make the Turbo 200 capacitors, which is the only universal capacitor that exists on the marketplace where you can replace multiple sizes with a single capacitor. It's a great convenience product. So this is what I want to say real quick. AMRAD makes great convenience products, products that save you time and save you money because you don't have to make multiple trips, reduces the number of parts you got to keep on your truck. And a lot of you will say, yeah, but you know, the price is a little more. But here's the thing. They also make the best product in the marketplace. And this comes from my experience over the years of seeing how well these things last out in the field. No product is going to have a 0% fail rate. I mean, it just doesn't happen, right? But I've seen AMRAD capacitors last just incredibly long periods of time. I saw a photo just a couple days ago from somebody who found one that was from 1995, a 20 microfarad capacitor from 1995, and they took it out of a system and retested it, and it's exactly 20 microfarads today. And it's because they do a really good job, not only with how they make them, but, but how they test them. They test every single one before it leaves. I saw the processes that they use. It's an excellent, excellent product. So not only do they make a very convenient product, they make it well. They make it in America. Family-owned business since 1939. The exact kind of business that I'm excited to work with and support. So if your local supply houses don't sell AMRAD capacitors and Turbo 200s, then I would suggest that you go up to the counter and say that that's what you want to see on the shelves because it really is a great product, and it's going to make you look good with your customers. It gives you a story to tell when that customer says, 
Why does this capacitor cost so much? I can buy it online. You say, you can't buy this one. Not for the price that you're looking at because this capacitor is American made, comes with a five year warranty and is better quality than anything else out there. Gives you a great story to tell your consumers and as well as a great value to them. So consider looking at the AMRAD American Radionics capacitors next time you're at a supply house. So getting liquid into the crankcase is still a really bad thing, but it's more of a long-term bad thing. And so that's why when people talk about, I've charged systems by beer can cold my whole life and I never had no problems. Well, yeah, because you don't have a problem like tomorrow or even next month. It's just the compressor fails on you three years when it would have normally lasted 12. Yeah. You don't know whether or not you cause damage to it or not based on a charging problem. Now, even more common in a compressor is that you have a flooded start. And a flooded start is where you have refrigerant liquid refrigerant that migrates to that compressor crankcase while it's off and then you get that liquid in there with the oil and when that thing starts it has a little mini explosion because all that heat and all that inertia all at once and that liquid starts boiling off really quick and that oil all gets foams and gets thrown out of the compressor and that causes a lot of damage in most cases where we see oil related damage and the type of equipment we work on is due to flooded starts as much as it is due to flooding when it's running those are both real considerations and that's why we have crankcase heaters in a lot of cases crankcase heaters are what help solve that problem because when you have and that's why crankcase heaters become even more important in heat pumps because in heat pumps we're operating them even when it's really cold outside so the system goes off right and then we're about to start it up when even let's say it's 20 degrees outside well the coldest point in that system is that compressor let alone the fact that the refrigerant oil attracts uh, refrigerant anyway so just by its very nature of being refrigerant oil and the vapor pressure there it attracts refrigerant into it plus add in the fact that it's the coldest section it's going to definitely condense liquid refrigerant inside there so using a crankcase heater helps prevent that it's probably the easiest way you can also use a pump down solenoid and some other things but that's a compressor okay so a compressor takes this vapor and it's very i want to use the opposite of dense being very loose it's like these molecules they're separated and it's low temperature and then you take it and you throw it into the head of this compressor and you slam these molecules together get them together yeah and then obviously as the pressure rises it goes against the discharge line pressure right and once the pressure is above the discharge line pressure a little opens up and allows the vapor refrigerant to flow through into the discharge line right right that is the traditional reciprocating valves that's when you have valves in it and so the pressure in the head obviously has to go higher than what's in the discharge line like kieran just said in the reciprocating compressor and then it opens that valve and that refrigerant goes out in a scroll, it's more continuous, and so it actually just, because it's sealed all the way back through, as it gets high enough pressure, then it just naturally goes out of that compressor. And a lot of scrolls do have a discharge check valve, which disallows it when it shuts off from that refrigerant from going back into the head, mm-hmm. but it's more continuous compression at that point. Does the vapor refrigerant leave the scroll compressor through the middle? Up? Yeah, the center of the scroll is the highest pressure point, yeah. So it goes out from the larger chambers in the outside, and then it's continuously compressed until it goes to the smallest chamber in the center and then discharged out. One of the real kind of magic things in air conditioning is this idea of why we go from this cool temperature suction line. You know, if you grab the large line, I mean, even for a complete amateur, one of the first things you'd probably do is touch the different components in the system. Don't touch the discharge line or compressor head, otherwise you're, you'll burn your hand. But you touch that suction line, which is the large line in a split system that goes in between the inside and outside, and you feel that it's cold, right? It's the joke, beer can cold. And a lot of times it'll condensate. And that's one of the kind of qualitative tests that technicians will do is they'll grab that line and they'll say, okay, the system is running or whatever. And so new guys see that. And so they grab that line. Oh, that's cold. And then you look at the discharge line, which is just on the opposite side of that compressor. And it is blazing stinking hot, right? And so a lot of technicians think that there's like some magical thing that happens there that makes it go from cold to hot. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing to understand, that all of the heat that's leaving the house, all of the heat that you're taking out of the house, because that's what you're doing with a refrigeration circuit. You're taking heat from a place that it's unwanted, namely inside, in the case of cooling. You're taking it from a place that's unwanted and putting it in a place where it's unobjectionable. That's the actual technical definition there. Removing it to a place that's unobjectionable. So you're taking it from inside, putting it outside when you're cooling. All of that heat is coming down that suction line. That freezing cold sweating exactly line. you yeah. grab that and you think oh that's the cold line that must be pumping cold into the house right in fact if you want a good joke have you seen the video from this old house the, their ac expert from this old house no i don't know what keyword you'll use to find it but it's pretty funny because he describes it that way he's like you can see here this cold line we call this the suction line and this brings the cold into the inside coil <laughs> and he's literally going backwards down the circuit because 
intuitively, that's how we think. We think that somehow the suction line's cold, so that must be pumping cold into the space, and that is not how it works. It's important first to sort of pin down why we think the way we do about this. We have this imagination that somehow this cold line is indicative of the cooling capacity of the system in some way. And the reason why we have this imagination is because we use our senses all the time to dictate what is hot, what is cold, right? Mm-hmm. I used to always say, and I think I probably even said in the earlier versions of this podcast, I used to say there's no such thing as cold. (laughs) Jim Bergman sent me a message after I said that, and he's like, actually, (laughs) actually, there's no such thing as hot. There is such thing as cold. Mm -mm. And this is something that I've come to the realization of, is that so much of what we do is we're measuring comparisons of energy. So when we say something is one degree, right, one degree is a measurement of temperature and temperature is average molecular velocity and we're measuring it in change so we would say we have water that's 40 degrees and then we have it we heat it up a little bit and goes to 41 degrees right and the definition of a btu is the amount of heat it takes to change the temperature of one pound of water by one degree fahrenheit right we use these kind of like measure of comparison and a degree is an example of that and so when i say that there's no such thing as cold Cold is not a thing that we can point to. It's not an energy state in that sort of comparative way. But there is such a thing as cold, and cold is the absolute absence of any heat. And that is absolute zero. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about a point, really the only point on the scale that we can point to when we're talking about heat is that zero point. Because there is no maximum point of heat. You can keep adding heat and the temperature can keep going up and up and up forever, right? Mm -hmm. But there is a point of origination. And that point of origination is the point of there being no heat. It's a hypothetical point, of course, because we can't achieve it. But it's a point at which no heat exists. So in one way, we can say there is such a thing as cold and cold is no heat. But everything other than that, we're doing comparisons. So when we say something is hot or cold, we're comparing it to the temperature of our bodies, right? About 99, 98, 99 degrees, right? And so when we feel something that's lower than the temperature of our skin, of our bodies, then it feels cool to us because our body gives off heat to it, right? Mm -hmm. And when we feel something that's higher temperature than our bodies, then we feel it as hot because we're absorbing heat from it. And so one of the kind of universal rules, really there's a couple, but one of the universal rules that we talk about all the time is hot goes to cold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A better way of saying that, I think, when you apply all the different elements of thermodynamics is just that energy tends towards equalization. Or whenever you have energy differences, differences in energy states, they tend to just stabilize and create a a medium point. So that's a way of thinking of it. Because lightning. Correct. Lightning would be an example of that. And in that case, it's electrical potential. So you have this electrical pressure that wants to be equalized. It's the same with humidity. High humidity and low humidity. High humidity goes to low humidity. High pressure goes to low pressure. High temperature goes to low temperature. That's ways of thinking of different energy states. High voltage goes to low voltage. And so when we grab a suction line and we feel it as being colder than our skin temperature, we think, well, that's cold, right? But the truth is, is that it's really not that simple because what we're doing when we move heat from inside to outside is we're leveraging this really powerful system that is the change of state of matter from one state to another. And that's really the secret sauce in what we're doing in cooling a home. And especially in the, we're going to focus on the air conditioning side here because we could mix it up with heat pumps, but let's keep it stuck on the air conditioning side. As a mini bonus for this episode, we did go off on a little side note on VRF versus ductless and some of the differences. And so that's what this is. If you want to listen to this, this is only take a couple minutes, but it was kind of off subject. So I put it here at the end. Do you know what the difference between VRF and ductless is? I give up. Was the VRF is the variable refrigerant flow? Variable refrigerant flow, right. And ductless is just like the, the mounted units on the wall, right? All right. So if you go to a commercial site, This is going to be a very meandering conversation, so just get used to it. But there's going to be lots of value bombs backed in here, everybody. Listen for the value bombs. (laughs) Oh, I'm listening. (laughs) Listen, okay. (laughs) So so a VRF system, if you go to a commercial site, and we deal with Mitsubishi, so Mitsubishi has... This is so fun! (laughs) (laughs) So Mitsubishi has a line called City Multi. And so you'll go into commercial buildings, and you'll see units that look very much like ductless heads in the building, right? Mm -hmm. And it'll be all over. And they all connect back to these large condensers. They call that VRF, variable refrigerant flow. Now, why don't they call it ductless? Well, the main reason they probably don't call it ductless is because they're not all ductless. A lot of the heads are actually ducted. Mm -hmm. The most common would be like a low static pancake. So it sits in a room and just has very, very short ducts attached to it. 
And so it's still ducted. It's still concealed, uh, maybe a ceiling cassette. There's just different types. And so they don't necessarily call them ductless because they're not all ductless. But how we define the difference between VRF and ductless, because we'll work on a uh, Mitsubishi MXZ unit that has multiple heads. We do this a lot. So you have a single condenser, multiple heads. We still call that ductless, right? right? We don't call that VRF. Well, that's where the line becomes fuzzy. So we call something VRF when it has multiple heads, usually more than two. And generally speaking, most manufacturers call it VRF once it's three phase. Yeah, that's primarily the distinction. So it's not because it has multiple metering devices? They all have multiple metering devices. You're right. Yeah, everything has to have a, its own metering device. But another distinction, and this is why I was going down this rabbit trail, is that most VRF systems use a true liquid line in between the condensing unit, the outside unit, mm -hmm. and the branch box. Mm -hmm. And then the metering devices are either in the branch box or, in some cases, they're in the heads themselves. And this is a distinction. It does vary slightly based on brand. Right. But in a lot of cases, what you're going to see is a liquid line in between the condenser and a branch box, and then from the branch box to the different VRF heads. And at that point, the branch box may have a metering device in it, metering devices in it, or it may not, and the metering devices may be at the fan coils, at the air handlers. But with the ductless, it's going to be in the condenser. This is a case where we see an expansion line isn't a ductless unit, and that's between the outside unit. Because the metering device is outside, you don't have a true liquid line. And so when you work on a ductless unit and you insulate that, what we would traditionally call the liquid line, the small line, that's the reason why you're insulating it, is because the pressure drop is at the condenser, and so that is a low temperature line. Make sense, Karen? That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And so if you're working on a VRF system where you have a branch box and the metering device is the branch box, in some cases you don't have to insulate that line. In some cases you do. It depends on two-pipe, three-pipe. There's different types of, of applications there, so follow your manufacturer specifications. But... When it's a liquid line, you generally don't have to insulate it. And when it's an expansion line, you generally do because a liquid line is near ambient temperature in most cases. And an expansion line is obviously lower mm -hmm. than ambient temperature because it's after the metering device. Yeah. Those are a few of the distinctions. Again, to kind of tie that dog, VRF versus ductless. Ductless is usually metering device outside, limited number of heads, limited length also. That's a challenge with using an expansion line is that right. you're really limited in the amount of distance you can go. Whereas in VRF, you need to be able to go a really far away and it's easier to pump liquid and not have losses than it is to use the expansion line. So with VRF, it's generally three phase, many heads, and the meter devices are either at the branch box or the air handler ductless. It's fewer heads, single phase, generally, although some brands do make a single phase VRF, which is really just a single phase unit that uses a branch box and multiple heads. There are some variances there, but gives you an idea of the ranges of what they call those things. So the basic refrigerant circuit is one of the cornerstones of what we do. Uh, there's so much both application and theory in our business and electrical application, electrical basics and diagnosis. That's a really important part. I talk about that a lot on the podcast, but this series, part one and part two is really the basics of how we move heat around, what we do every day with refrigeration. And this truly is refrigeration. Because like I've mentioned, air conditioning doesn't require refrigeration. Willis Carrier made his first air conditioner without using the refrigerant circuit at all. But so much of what we do focuses on the refrigerant circuit. And that's what this was all about. So hopefully you found that helpful. If you have any feedback for me, you can always email me, Brian, B-R-Y-A-N, at HVACRschool.com. You can find all of our daily tech tips and quizzes and calculators and all the resources that we have, all the podcasts, all the videos, everything we do, you can find at HVACRschool.com. There's a search box there on HVACRschool.com that you can use to find anything. So in this episode, I talked a little bit about saturation and how that's often misunderstood thing. If you want to read more about saturation, if you want to read up on the five pillars of refrigerant circuit diagnosis, if you want to read up about evacuation, checking the charge without gauges, all those things are popular topics we've talked about on the podcast and also in writing. And you can find those both at HVACRschool.com, as well as if you want to see more about the other podcasts that we do, you can find those podcasts by going to bluecollarroots.com. We have a, a new podcast that is the Electrical Code and Tips podcast, where we talk specifically about the electrical trade. You may find that interesting. There's a lot of crossover between electrical and HVAC. We talk about sizing conductors and sizing breakers and setting up an equipment room, all that sort of stuff. You may find that interesting, and you can get that at the Blue Collar Roots website, bluecollarroots.com. This is Brian Orr <laughs> with HVAC 
school podcast. And I have a lot of good sponsors. People who care about me because I care about them. Was that it? No. This episode of the HVAC School Podcast is made possible. <laughs> what are you? This is so exciting. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the HVAC School Podcast. You can find more great HVACR education material and subscribe to our short daily tech tips by going to HVACRschool.com. If you enjoy the podcast, would you mind hopping on iTunes or the podcast app and leave us a review? We would really appreciate it. See you next week on the HVAC School Podcast.